the show where anything goes. Motivation, mindset, recovery, philosophy, and life. We become who we are through what we experience. We all have a story. And this is My Backstory with Josh Boyer. Um, here we go. So here we are in Livermore, California. We were in Fremont, but now we're in Livermore. Yeah. <clears throat> and we're doing a dude. Every time I do a podcast, I always feel like I need to clear my throat all the time. It's super frustrating. So I apologize to the listeners <laughs> because it's super annoying. It's more annoying to me than it probably is to you. But anyway, I'm here with um with Jeremy Muschella, who is uh and I, I said this yesterday, but I'll say it again. He's Irish and not Italian. I was kind of a little disappointed by that because I thought, oh, it's Muschella. You know, it just sounded like kind of a. Doesn't it sound Italian? Am I tripping? Does that sound no, Italian? No, I've, I've been asked many times if it's Italian. So you could don't pass feel for bad. an Italian, dude, for sure. I could. You got the dark hair, light eyes, maybe Northern Italian. Yeah, yeah for sure. So a uh, little backstory: I um, I met Jeremy because I, when I was stationed in England, I met his wife who came over to visit somebody and. Um, turned out that uh, his wife Vanessa and I knew a lot of the same um, girls that I grew up with because she's uh, played club soccer and this and that so it's kind of cool um, because you know you're away from home 6,000 miles away or whatever it was and it's like I meet this girl that knows some of the pe- uh, people that I knew and I was like oh wow you know it just kind of felt like being at home again but she was a really good cook so she was like cooking us like uh, blueberry muffins with every meal and it was, it was kind of cool to have like you know familiar face from home but anyway um, fast forward 15, 16 years, um, and uh, and we reconnect, and she's married to, to Jeremy, who's a police officer for Fremont Police Department. And I thought it'd be really cool to have him on the podcast to let him share his story, you know? And it's kind of funny because you never know, you see police officers and you just kind of like make an assumption of like what their background is and where they come from, but you really don't know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I know from myself speaking, like I, you know, I thought like, I was alone in all my own family drama and family shit I had going on. And you talk to other people and you're like, wow, you're not that special, dude. There's so many other people that have some of the same stories and the same heartaches and drama in their families. So anyway, I want to, I want Jeremy to share his story with you guys, kind of where he, where he grew up and what his life was like growing up, why he decided to be a police officer, what he's doing as a police officer now and like what his plans are for the future. So Go ahead, brother. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me on. I yeah, appreciate it. For sure, brother. So I was uh, born here in the Bay Area. And uh, when I was about a year old, my family settled in Fremont, California. And so I kind of grew up there uh, all the way through high school, even in, into uh, junior college. Uh, kind of grew up in a, an abusive home. I had a, a very abusive father who uh, he liked to hand out uh, beat downs for, uh, you know, for just about anything. So uh, kind of, you know. Uh, mentally had to deal with that growing up. Um, kind of had uh, many effects on me as I was growing up. I, I uh, Once I got into like junior high and high school, kind of had a bad attitude and I got into plenty of fights uh, because of that. Um, kind of going back to when I was uh, uh, younger, I was about four years old. And uh, this is my, my first introduction to the police was... Uh, our house was broken into and there was uh the cop that showed up to our house was uh just uh dialed in his uniform was pressed and sharp his boots were polished and he just he he looked like he owned it you know he came yeah. into the house and i was you know like four years old and completely impressed by this dude um and that kind of i think planted the seed for me to uh, get into law enforcement uh, you know, I grew up in a, you know, lower middle class neighborhood. Uh, there was plenty of, uh, you know, bad kids that hung out in the neighborhood and, uh, every day kind of growing up, I would see the Fremont PD, uh, in my neighborhood every day. They were, you know, getting the choices. It's all good. It's dogs doing their job. <laughs> Don't worry. Every day uh, I'd see the police chasing these dudes on the street and uh, I was impressed by it. I liked it. Um, and I think that kind of further planted the seed that I wanted to be a cop when I was older. Um, were you straight laced like growing up, like didn't do drugs, didn't smoke weed, didn't do like what some of the other kids were doing? No, I really, I, I kind of knew in the back of my head, I wanted to be a cop, uh, you know, so I, yeah. I, I tried to do my best to stay away from that. Yeah. Um, you know, I did, I did my fair share of drinking in high school. Right. I, uh, 
I would kill a 12 pack on a Friday night after a football game, you know, but, uh, what are your thoughts on that? I have asked a couple of cops about that and, uh, how like you have some cops that they're applying for these jobs and it's like, they're total, like for lack of a better word, like total squares. They have done nothing. You know what I mean? It's like, Nope, never smoked weed. Nope. Never drank a beer. Nope. 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 They're like, okay, you're hired. And it's like, do you really want those kind of guys? Like they don't understand the streets. They don't understand like what real life is all about. Well, you know? those I've come to find out th- those guys, uh, they learn it, but they learn it on the job. They don't come into the job having that, uh, that experience and that what do you background. Think better, though? Like if it, if it was you being the hiring, uh, hiring official for that position. I think well, it's always better to hire somebody that's got a little bit of edge to them. They're yeah. going to be a better cop. I mean, that's, there's what I, no, that's what I would think, but I don't. I don't know. Yeah, there's there's no doubt about uh, no doubt about it. My background and experience growing up, I mean, it definitely helped me become a better cop. Right. Yeah, I would imagine like you know coming in like for me like I I would want to have because I, I always wondered like with my background. I was like, man, can I even be a cop? Yeah, I smoked weed and I did stuff growing up and, and whatever. I never got really heavy into like drugs or anything like that. It just wasn't really my thing. Um, but I remember they were like disqualifying people if you like even admitted that you smoked weed. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, every, kind of every agency has its own standards uh, right. for their background. But, uh, you know, usually they'll allow some drug use, but there has to be, you know, a period of time between the last time you did it and the time you, you get hired. Right. So you got on with uh, with Fremont. We were talking about yesterday that you started as like a, a cadet, right? Or as a was it a cadet? Yeah. So um, kind of go into that story. I was, uh, uh, you know, my parents didn't have a lot of money, so yeah. I didn't know. Uh, you know, I, I knew my uh, options of going to a university or you know four year college were. You know, that wasn't in the cards because um, you know my parents just didn't have the money. So. Uh, uh, I knew I was either going to go to junior college or go the military route. So uh, I think I was a senior in high school. I started uh, looking at uh, a couple of branches in the military. So my dad was in the Air Force. So I looked at the Air Force. Uh, I went on uh, some tours of a couple of uh, Air Force bases. Yep. Uh, I remember taking a bus trip up to uh, Marysville to Beale yeah. Air Force Base. And uh, I rode dirt bikes all growing up. And I remember still to this day pulling in to uh, Beale Air Force Base and there was just dirt bikes everywhere. Yeah. So I was like, this might be the place for me. That's funny, dude. I, uh, when I was signing up to go to the Air Force, because um, I knew I was going to the Air Force, it wasn't really an option for me to do uh, anything else. And uh, I didn't talk to anybody. I didn't talk to my grandma. I didn't talk to anybody, really. I just went to the recruiter and I was like, I'm out of here. you know. And uh, so he shows me this video and he's like, cause he, he's like, what do you want to do? And I was like, ah, like shoot guns, kill people. You know, like I just, whatever. I think maybe that was my answer. I don't remember exactly what it was, but probably somewhere along those lines, I wanted to do some cool guy shit. And he's like, oh, I got, I got a video for you. So he pops in this video and sees dudes rolling around in dirt bikes and ATVs and, you know, M16s and just tearing and, shit and up. And you were sold. I was sold, bro. I was like, <laughs> oh dude, where do I sign up? And it was for security forces to be a cop. Yeah. I was like, man, these cops in the military are high speed. And uh, and then you know fast forward a couple of years, dude, and I'm standing on a gate for like 14 yes. hours. Yep. This is nothing like the ATVs yep. and dirt bikes I saw. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So I uh, I got uh, one of the Marine recruiters got a hold of me yeah. and uh, kind of talked me into joining the Marine Corps. And uh, I was absolutely adamant, like I wanted to be a an MP because I, I want to be a cop. So right. why would I do any other job except MP and he tried to talk me out of it and was like, no, you don't trust me. You don't want to be an MP in the Marines. But uh, so anyway, my, uh, my intention was to join the Marine Corps after high school. And uh, I mean, within a week after high school, I, uh, me and some friends uh, went down partying in San Jose, ended up getting into a pretty nasty fight and uh, ended up breaking my leg really bad, my tib and my fib. And I was in a cast for like six months. So... I think the next week I went into the recruiter's office on crutches and a cast up to my hip and uh, he just went absolutely crazy on me. And yeah. so I was like, well, I guess maybe I'm not gonna join the Marines. So yeah. uh ended up enrolling at a junior college in Fremont and uh, just going the college route. What did you, uh, what were you majoring? Administration of Justice. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. 
<clears throat> and then, so what happened after that? So you were in college, and then you decided, like at that point, like, hey, I'm gonna go apply for Fremont so you can get. Yeah. It. So, so one day, I just came from home from school and checked the mailbox, and there was a flyer from Fremont PD, yeah. and there was a job opening for a police cadet, and I had no idea what it was. Uh, but you know, the job description basically said, you know, you. Uh, you have to take at least 10 units in school, maintain a C average, and then you work 20 hours a week at the police department, All right. making 10 bucks an hour, you know, in 1990, yeah. that was pretty decent money. So I was like, sign me up. So, so uh, part of that program, which actually isn't around anymore, is uh, you have to, uh, take all the uh, same tests you would take to get hired as a police officer. Yeah. And so the idea behind it was if you could pass all these tests, then once you're old enough, they just do an updated background and then you get hired as a cop. Yeah. So I went through the testing process, uh, came out number one and uh, waited about nine months while they did my background and actually uh, ended up hiring me. It's pretty awesome, man. Has it been weird like seeing the people like transition in and out of that? police department just because you've been there for so long so it's like you like it's, grew up there it is it is weird because uh you know for the longest time when i first started i was the youngest person in the department i was the you know the only cop to get hired there at 21 and so i was the youngest person for so long and then now i don't feel like my age but you right. know now i'm in my 26th year there and now i'm the number number two in seniority in the entire department so it's a trip it is uh it is it is strange were you, um, was there ever a time when you first started out that you were like kind of nervous or scared, like being out on the beat? Like, were you like, oh dude, what am I doing? No, I always wanted, I just always wanted to do that job. Yeah. And uh, I was always excited to go to work. So I was never, you know, I mean, there's moments where, you know, you get a little bit of pucker factor, but right. it's not like I was, uh, you know, ever scared or anything. I feel like I would be kind of nervous, maybe like just going on the beat for the first time, you know. But you have your FTO, right? That you're with yeah. for how long? How long are you with your FTO before they release you to be? Well, on the at run? the at the time, it was uh, you would have three phases, and there were four weeks each, and then you had a two week checkout phase. Okay. So it's at least oh, and then you had a week in uh, traffic. So it's like a 15, 16 week program. Right. It's longer now. And what kind of things did you do within the department? So like you started off as a police officer, but like what's the opportunity to? Hey, I'm going to go canine or I'm going to go bomb squad or I'm going to go SWAT or I'm going to go whatever. Like what are the opportunities with Fremont? So we don't have a bomb squad, but we, you know, pretty much have every other kind of, you know, collateral specialty assignment you'd want to do. So, um, yeah, my career path, uh, I did, you know, I worked the street for in patrol as a cop for about four years. And then, uh, I got an opportunity to go to our street crimes unit, which is, uh, to plain clothes, you know, a uh, proactive unit and you're rolling around in an unmarked car and you know for a kid who's god was 25 years old it was like the dream job you know oh, sure and uh, so i did that for about two years and then went back to patrol did uh did the fto thing for a little bit and then i went to our detective bureau um uh, i started out working in our uh uh auto theft unit and then I moved over to our Crimes Against Persons uh, Bureau, where I did uh, sexual assault investigations. And then I was our uh, sexual assault uh, or sex registrant investigator. Wow. Which jobs out of all the ones you've done so far were your favorite? You think? Uh, well, I'll get to that job. That was my most recent assignment. So, uh, so I did uh, about three and a half years in uh, detectives, and then I rotated back out to patrol. And then uh, I was used pretty heavily as an FTO for the f next three years after that. I trained recruits for about, all right, for three years. For I trained about 13 recruits in that three-year period. So it was pretty much nonstop. Uh, and then I tested and went back into our detective bureau. And this time I was our robbery homicide uh, detective. Yeah. So I did that for about three and a half years. I finished up as our... Uh, uh, semi-permanent robbery homicide investigator which is essentially you could you could finish out your career there as long as you were performing yeah. uh, but while i was doing that job i tested uh, i was testing for sergeant and i got promoted to sergeant That's pretty so, cool. so then i uh, rotated back out to patrol and then uh, now you know as a new sergeant you're back at the bottom of the uh, seniority pole so now I'm back, you know, working graveyard shift and based on it's based on grade though at that point, right? Correct. Time. Yeah. 
<clears throat> so I'm back out on the street and uh, I do that for a few years. And then uh, a new job opens up uh, in our uh, major crimes task force. Yeah. At the time there was, there were some leadership issues. They, uh, they had some issues with uh, the, the uh, unit commander. So he was removed. And so they, decided they needed some more supervision in that unit. So they opened up a sergeant spot and I tested for it and I got it. Nice. And so that was 2014. So I went in there and uh, it was, uh, at the time it was an offsite. We, were, we had an offsite uh, office yeah. and uh, there were some people in there that probably needed to uh, not be in that unit anymore. So we went through some growing pains. Yeah. We were able to, uh, we're able to uh, move some people out and we uh, were able to select our, our the team we wanted. And so uh, we kind of grew from there. And uh, during that time we moved uh, back on site to the police Fremont PD. Right. So we were uh, back in the building, which was, uh, it, it was good because now we were visible and people, you know, that worked, uh, you know, uniform or detectives, they would see us on a daily basis. So we had that More accountability. Yeah, it was, it was better. So um, we were doing a lot of uh, undercover uh, narcotics work, uh, gangs. We did a lot of uh, gun investigations. And then uh, we kind of uh, started doing uh, fugitive, fugitive apprehension at the time. And that's kind of really what uh, I, I, that was a bread and butter that I really liked to do. Um, and I really got into the fugitive appreh apprehension. And so we would get tasks from uh, you know, the investigative divisions of the different uh, participating agencies. So we had uh, CHP, DOJ, uh, Fremont PD, uh, Newark PD, and Union City PD, and then uh, our probation department. Wow. So if uh, any of the participating agencies had uh, they were a case that they were working where they had, you know, a, ser you know, a violent uh, felon that they needed uh, arrested, then we would many times get tasked with that. So that'd be fun. It was, it, it was awesome. So, uh, we went after, you know, multiple homicide suspects, uh, suspects that had done, you know, series of violent armed robberies and that kind of thing. What was the most sketchy situation on those that you went on? So there was a couple, I mean, uh, my team was involved in a, uh, I was involved in a fatal shooting, uh, in 2017 where we we're going after, uh, a crew of, uh, violent armed robbers. And then, uh, about a year after that, uh, we were uh, doing a surveillance of, uh, some gang members out of Hayward that were, that had come into Union City and Fremont and then done some shootings and they were while we were doing surveillance, uh, they were on their way to the Dakota district in Union City to do a hit. So right. we ended up taking them off and that turned into a shootout and uh, turned into just this crazy where they two, two of the suspects bailed on foot. Right. The driver bailed out in the car. So we had, you know, three things going at one time. Right. There was two shooting scenes. So that was pretty chaotic and then we had one uh, one of our uh detectives had gone in foot pursuit and uh was on a, a different radio channel so he was missing for about five minutes so oh, we had a, yeah it was just uh it was the most chaotic uh call that i've ever dealt with have you ever lost anybody in line of duty? <clears throat> like uh, anybody you're working with uh so i've lost friends to believe it or not to cancer and uh heart attacks but uh right. None, none to a gunfire. That's awesome, man. Yeah, I mean that's a blast. Not that they died of cancer, yeah. obviously, but like the, yeah. it wasn't in line of duty. Yeah. What would you say some of the biggest challenges are of the job? Well, I mean things, uh, just like anything, you know, things evolve, and this job has uh, evolved immensely over the last twenty six years. So the challenges now are much different than they were when you know when I first started. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of negative connotations to to this career choice. You know, there's, you know, you have the, uh, you know, the left media that uh, definitely doesn't portray us in a, uh, a good light many times. You know, sometimes it's deserved, but most times it's not. Do you ever feel the need to um, clear your name, if you will? Like, if you see your name, like if someone looks you up and they're like, oh, I see this guy. 
when you first started, did you have like a need to be like, no, nah, it's not right. Let me correct you. Or were you just like, whatever, they're going to report what they report. And that is what it is. Well, I will, t- I will tell you when, uh, as I get older, I give less of a shit what people think about me. Right. But, uh, I mean, anybody can, you can Google my name and you're going to find there's, there's articles out there written that are negative, that are just flat out lies. Right. So, I mean, uh, I know they're all bullshit, but they do bother me because anybody can read those. And if they don't, uh, you know, they could take it as face value that it's, that it's fact right. when it's not. And uh, so, yeah, that does bother me. How many cops would you say uh, in your experience on a, you know, I guess percentage wise where it's like they're meant to be cops, like they're, they're, they should be a cop. And then how many of those are like have the potential for, for being dirty cops? And how does that, is that prevalent? I guess, if you will, it's that, well, I can tell you <clears throat> in, in my experience with the agencies that I've worked with yeah. that, uh, it is, uh, it's minuscule. Right. Yeah. I, I, could tell, I could tell you a story. Uh, in 1998, I was, uh, when I was working on our street crimes unit, I had the opportunity to go work, uh, in a task force, uh, up in, uh, Oakland. Yeah. It, it was run by our sheriff's department. And uh, there were some federal agents, uh, one, one from the marshal service in particular. And so uh, I, had, uh, I had this case, a heroin case for sale in, uh, in Oakland that I served a search warrant on. And I essentially caught this dude uh, who's a US marshal pocketing money. So uh, I, I reported it and it was investigated. And uh, so that was my first experience of anything, you know, dirty, you know, any, you know, coming across any kind of dirty cop. So uh, I was pretty uh, not used to that, man. Where, where I come from, everybody's uh, pretty straight laced as far as, uh, you know, all the cops that I work with. Yeah. And so uh, even the thought of another cop stealing money was completely foreign to me. Yeah. So I know talking to my brother, he, uh, was working uh, Vice for a while. I think it was called Vice, maybe. Yeah, but anyway, um, he said they would have like like stacks of like money, like like stack when they do like a, oh, yeah. a actually, takedown or whatever. Show you pictures on my phone of right. yeah, sixty thousand like, dollars sitting on a table. Yeah, and he's like, you know, it's funny because he's like the human natural. It's natural for humans to like look at that and be like, dude, I'll just take a little pinch of that. You know, they'll never know. Invest. I mean, uh internal affairs will never see it like you know however they're inventorying it they're not going to know if you take any money and he's like so the temptation is always there because like if you think about it, like cops aren't making that much money on you know, the big scheme of things you know what i mean like unless you're working overtime it's not the best paying job it's not the worst paying job it's yeah. also not the best and so, so you always had that temptation of like ah, just one little pinch and i can pay off all my debt you know and um but he's like you just obviously you don't you don't do it because that's not what you signed up to do you know it's like yeah. there's a lot of integrity um, but there are obviously some cops out there that are doing dirty shit, obviously, like that guy that was pocketing money, you know? Like, I ran into a guy, um, I, I went to school with him. We weren't in the same grade, but um, I had heard that he was a cop, and I was like, this dude? Like, how the hell did he get through backgrounds and everything? Because mm-hmm. he was kind of like a knucklehead, you know? And um, it just struck me as odd that he was, a, he was a police officer. My wife and I both were like, it's weird. And um, sure enough, man. Um, you know, acts like a dog, talks like a dog, walks like a dog, probably a dog, you know? Mm-hmm. So like he ended up, he was like serving like bogus warrants, you know, like on, uh, weed shops and stuff like that. And, <laughs> um, ended up, you know, getting popped, getting caught for it. Yeah. You know, well, like, I, I will say lit- virtually all of them get caught at some point. Yep. It's a trip. Cause I think it would be easy in my opinion, like, especially so that's, that's, I guess that goes back to my first question I was asking about coming in as a straight laced dude or a, a dude that's like rough around the edges. And sometimes a call of the streets, if you come in a little too rough around the edges, it's the call of the street is kind of like, it calls your name again, you know, yeah. because that's kind of your background to where you come from, you know, but yeah. if you're a, more of a straight laced kid, it's like, you're, you're not even aware of that kind of shit. Yeah. You know what I mean, unless you, you learn about it while you're on the job, but yeah. I feel like this dude that I'm talking about, like it was part of who he was yeah. even before he became a cop, yeah. you know? So when and the opportunity was, presents he, itself, yeah. he just took it. He was one of the few that managed to slip through the cracks. Right. Because the hiring process is no joke. No. I mean, there's, there's dudes that I know personally that, uh, there's some that like that guy, like I have no clue how the hell he became a cop. There's other guys that have applied and they don't get in. it's like, what? You're the most straight list dude I know. Like, how are you, how did you not get in? Well, you know, 
the polygraph or whatever. Uh, I told the truth. I mean, it would like be simple, stupid things yeah. and they wouldn't make it. And I'm like, that's super strange, man. But yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I would get hired today. <laughs> <laughs> how, uh, how would you say that like your job um, affects your family? Uh, I think the biggest effect is, uh, I mean, I work a good amount of overtime, especially when I was, uh, when I was working on our task force, it yeah. was, I mean, a 60 hour week was, uh, that's a, that's a short week. So, uh, and it was always constantly answering the phone. Uh, so, uh, time away from the family is the big thing and, you know, missing, uh, missing events, you know, kids events, sporting events and, uh, holidays and that kind of thing is, uh, it takes a toll, but you know, the other part of it is, uh, you know, this job is mentally taxing at times and yeah. then you may be at home, but you're not necessarily present you know if you know what i mean yeah, so totally. uh, uh that's that's one of the biggest ways it can affect your family like uh if you could do anything differently from the beginning till now like what would that have been as, yeah, in regards to your family yeah I, I i would definitely uh make sure that i'm when i'm home being more president or being more present uh you <laughs> well, know i don't segue I, segue us into the next question yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. so uh <laughs> You know, just being present while I'm here and, uh, you know, being tentative, you know, to their needs and that kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that we talked about yesterday, um, I, did, I wasn't really aware before I talked to you that there was like a, a union for cops. So it's like you work for Fremont Police Department, but there's a union that's protecting these police officers. Yeah, we don't. It and, is a union. We don't call it that. We call it a police association, but it's okay. it's a union. So, yeah. So like the police association and then you became a president of that association. I did. And that's an elected position? It is. That's elected by who? By by the dues paying members. So for us, it would be our police officers and police sergeants. Do you do a uh, like campaign and stuff like that for it? Is it kind of like you put your name on a ballot? So, you know, I'll tell you, uh, it, being the union president uh, is an undesirable job. Yeah. And so uh, most people, they know it's a lot of work. They don't really know what it entails. But it's it's like having a second full time job. So if somebody wants to put in for it, everybody is like, "Go for it, bro!" You know, they're like, yeah. uh, you know, all the more power to you. What's the draw for it? Like, I mean, is there any upside to like, yeah, you're the you're the union president? Like, what are some of the benefits of doing it? Well, I mean, not a whole lot to be honest. Right. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, uh, you know, uh, I could. You know, when I was president, I could call the mayor and she would answer the phone. And right. if I had an issue, I'd be like, hey, you know, blah, 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 whatever the issue was. Uh, not everybody has that ability to do that. Uh, I guess that would be one of the benefits. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, I got to uh, travel around a little bit for it. Um, you know, they, I go, it'll, they'll, they'll, the, we'll go to some trainings, uh, and you get to see a different side of things. So the benefit, uh, really is you learn things that you normally wouldn't learn. Right. Um, you get exposed to some things that you wouldn't, if you were not in that position. So, you know, yeah. for personal growth and, you know, just experience that's, that's the benefit. It's freaking cool. And you're, you're done with it now, right? Like you just gave it up. I am done it about three weeks, uh, three weeks out. <laughs> So I served my two year term and uh, I, I elected not to run again. Yeah. I don't blame you, man. Yeah. Especially when you got a family and stuff. Yeah. I want to ask you a question that I, I, we didn't talk about it yesterday, but I figured like, I want to ask you about it. What is your thought process on um, all these school shootings? I asked one of the, I had a, another police officer, uh, Jason Davis on the, um, on the podcast. And I asked him that question. What do you think the solution is for that? Well, I mean, I think the first thing is schools are soft targets, you know? So, I mean, to, uh, to immediately address the problem, I mean, you want to harden the target, you know, make it harder for uh, somebody with, uh, with, you know, with a gun to get into the school yeah. and get and have access. Uh, you know, the other thing is having uh, SROs on, you know, on staff that are actually engaged that can identify potential, you know, problem students. Yeah. Do you think uh, it would be a good idea to arm teachers? So uh, I'm not against that. Uh, I would never want to mandate, uh, you know, right. somebody to be armed that didn't want to be. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you have, uh, say, you, have, you know, former military or, you know, the military veteran that's not a teacher and they go, yeah, I want to be armed. Uh, I would I would be open to that for sure. 
Yeah, somebody had mentioned that there was like a manpower issue. It's like, no, we don't have enough cops or we don't have enough people to like man all of these schools. And then somebody made the the you know the proposal like, do you understand how many veterans are out there mm-hmm. that like they're they're done in the military and they would love nothing more than to be posted on schools making sure these kids were safe there's Mm -hmm. plenty of veterans that would go and work these schools so it's kind of a it's mind-boggling to me and i think part of that um i I don't give a shit about getting political so i'm about to get political i think part of that is the left-leaning you know liberal agenda of Mm -hmm. like oh guns are bad like no more guns like if you if you add somebody with a gun that's basically like adding to the problem i guess in their opinion and for me it's like i really do believe in the argument that the, the only thing to stop a or the the best thing about a guy with a a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with yep. one. You know what I mean? That's the way you stop it. Yeah. And I, there's plenty of people. I'd say the majority, uh, definitely the majority of gun owning, responsible gun owning adults are responsible people that don't have any intention of ever harming anybody. You know, it's a very very small 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 minority of people that are going out and and committing these atrocities. And I think there's plenty of people like myself included. You know, I I have kids, man. I got four sons. You know, yeah. it's like. Um, just, I, I mean, even the thought like brings tears. My eyes thinking about like, what if that was one of my kids at these schools, you know, for sure. And what are we doing to protect our kids? And I, I can't be in the homes with these other kids. So I don't know what kind of upbringing they had um, or what's happening in the home. But what I do know is that I can do something about it by protecting our kids, by having someone there that's armed and proficient. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause if anything, it's just a deterrent, you know, it's like when you have like, I guess the same concept with your house. It's like you go outside someone's house and you see like, you know, size, you know, 14 shoes outside and you, the lights are on and like this, you're probably not in a, in a dog's barking. Yep. Chances are you're not going to go in that house Yeah. because you just don't want the hassle of it. Right. Yep. Same thing with a school shooter. Like if you, if there's an active shooter situation or a guy like even remotely thinking about coming to school, uh, shooting a school up, it's like, nah, dude, I'm not going to think twice because there's a bunch of armed dudes here that are not going to allow Absolutely. this to happen, you know? Yep. Um, so I, I hope that conversation starts to happen, you know, because I think there's there's obviously there's a, a macro level that we need to talk about as far as like, you know, uh, responsible gun ownership and how are these kids getting access to these guns and background checks and blah. I mean, we can go down that rabbit hole, but it's not really necessary. I just think that yeah. I think how many of those kids are on psychosomatic drugs. Right. Because I think that's the majority of the problem. It's, yeah. a, it's, it's a mental health issue. Yes. You know, obviously, because like, there's not normal people that don't have mental issues going and shooting kids up in a school. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, but we, I mean, we can't skirt the issue, though. Something needs to happen. Yeah. <laughs> we can't have another school yeah. shooting. There's and just it's no not, way. And it's not banning AR-15s. No, no, no. Definitely not. And that's, that's <laughs> the other thing that you get into a, a weird... Um, a very strange conversation when people want to start removing guns from people. Like, well, let's infringe upon people's rights that are, like I said, responsible gun owners. Let's take all of their guns away or restrict their gun ownership. And it's like, why? Why would you do that? How does that, how does that solve anything? Like, I hate to break it to people, but it's like, I mean, look at prisons. You know, you're not allowed to have drugs in prison. Well, guess what? <laughs> there is a shit ton of drugs in prison. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like, um, I think they said that the couple areas where there is a no gun policy i think chicago right is one of them where there's like yeah. gun bans like well, chicago. chicago is the strictest gun laws in the nation yeah strict gun laws in, in the nation but one of the i think it's the highest um uh murder capital it's like the murder capital of the world i think uh if it's not the murder capital i think they have the most shootings yeah yeah it's insane man so it's like it's obviously not doing anything yeah <laughs> you know I mean? like so there's more to the issue and i don't, I don't think taking everyone's guns is i i know it's not the answer Um, Because I know that, like I said, there's plenty of people out there that are law-abiding citizens that have no intentions of ever harming anybody. Yeah. Um, And at the end of the day, regardless if you take them away or not, there's always going to be bad people that get their hands on them somehow, some way. Yep. It just happens. (laughs) Um, What do you think about your upbringing um, was the catalyst for you to be a police officer? Uh, Well, it's probably a series of things, but, you know, I think, uh, you know, growing up, in a, in a, you know, with an abusive father. Uh, and I saw him, uh, you know, in his line of work, he was an airline mechanic for United airlines for 40 years. And he hated his job. He was, he would always, you know, come home miserable. And so, you know, that kind of drove me to doing something bigger, you know, and, you know, service oriented. So, uh, seeing that, you know, uh, uh, just him miserable, hating his job. Uh, I mean, he, (laughs) He did some crazy shit. He uh, 
he would uh, he was like very like anti you know the, the anti uh, corporation you know anti establishment yeah he was very anti uh, you know the United Airlines but you know that's who he worked for so right. he got in a little bit of trouble because he what he would he did was he printed up all these uh, stickers and he handed them out to everybody at work and they were it was. Uh, I don't know if you remember the old stickers people used to put on the back of their car of like this kid pissing on whatever. Yeah, and it yeah, was yeah. Uh, he had all these stickers. He had like a the thousand Calvin and Hobbes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had like a thousand <laughs> or fifteen hundred stickers made up of that character pissing on the United Airlines symbol, <laughs> and like he 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 would hand them out to everybody at his, work. His employer, yeah. He would like <laughs> stick the stickers all over work, and yeah. And they knew it was him or what? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he got caught. Oh, yeah. dude, that's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I mean, sometimes you gotta wonder though. You know, what I mean, like, was it the job that sucked, or was it maybe like he was just a disgruntled? Yeah, he was a dude. disgruntled dude. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Did you ever get to a point like um, I luckily didn't? Uh, I mean, my stepdad would spank me and stuff like that, but I wouldn't say it was ever abuse. Um, I, but I did get to a point with my stepdad where like. Yeah, you know, he went to spank me or whatever with a belt and I turned around and like shoved him, you know, and like he went through like a door or whatever. And I think it was eighth grade when I got to that level. And he was just kind of like, could he have whooped my ass? Yeah, definitely. He could have beat the shit out of me right there on the spot. But I think he knew that like, well, I can, but like this is going to be a fight. Like he's yeah. not, he's not going to go down like easy, you know? Yeah. Did you ever get that point where your dad where I was oh, like, yeah. I can kick your ass now. So like oh, yeah. stop messing with me. Oh yeah. So it was, uh, I, I uh I can I got size pretty young. You know, I was in eighth grade. I was six feet tall, about 185 pounds. Yeah. So I was a big, big kid. And I think I was 15 when I decided that I had had enough of his shit. And yeah. so uh, uh, he got in my face. I remember in the backyard and and uh, doing work, like doing yard work. Yeah. And uh, he got in my face, and I was like, "Fuck, today's the day." And so uh, we, I squared up on him, and I was like, "We're gonna fight." Yeah. and uh my mom you know freaks out and she <laughs> she yeah too, she huh? yeah she jumped in the middle and right. so uh kind of we, we, from there on out I, once once i stood up to the bully it was like uh didn't really you know didn't happen it again but it was kind of like a fuck you fuck you kind of thing yeah, yeah for sure but he never messed with you again though right no mm -mm. That's interesting. I think it always takes that that one time, dude. Just yeah. that, that one step up, you know. And like even with my with my stepdad, it wasn't like I said, it wasn't abuse. It was just I was just tired of getting spanked. You know, I was like, dude, like I'm too old for this shit. Dude. Yeah, I, <laughs> like I definitely reached my breaking point. Yeah, so I was like, no, I'm done. Dude. This, is, this yeah. is ridiculous. What do you think about? Like, did you know his his dad? Yeah. yeah. Was he the same way? Uh, I don't. It's, it's hard to say, man. My parents from the generation they didn't they didn't really like to talk about you know, things. I know my dad had a, a shitty, uh, he had a shitty childhood growing up. Yeah. You know, I think he was uh, 13 years old when he came home from school, found his mom dead on the couch. Oh, she, had, she, you know, she had cancer, but she passed away in the house. This is, you right. know, she was, you know, in the fifties or something. Yeah. So, uh, um, and then his dad, at, you know, while his mom was, uh, you know, dying on the couch, his dad was, you know, having an affair with some lady down the street. And so, as soon as his mom dies, he moves that lady in. And oh, wow. so uh, he ends up getting kicked out of the house. He had to live in like a shed in the backyard. And the new stepmom like gave his dog away. And it was, you know, just yeah. just shitty, you know? Yeah. But still, I mean, no excuse, you know, <clears throat> to, be a, to be abusive. No um, excuse, but I think that there is like, for me, like my journey lately has been, it's hard to do, but like I've been trying to like, any animosity I had toward my parents or toward anybody is like, try to see their perspective not that it makes it right at all sure but to see like where did they come from what's yeah. their history you know like why why are they that way yeah and sometimes there really is no explanation like when i talk about my mom it's like we don't have a relationship and it's like there's mental health issues there yeah like it's not a matter of like oh well her upbringing was this or it was that or whatever and i'm not saying that it was perfect because maybe it wasn't maybe yeah. her upbringing was a little challenging but I think when you have some mental health concerns there, it's like, well, I mean, there's no changing that. Yeah. <laughs> you know I mean, like it is what it is, you know, um, especially if you're not willing to address it or you're not willing to get the help that you need. Yep. I mean, everyone else is the problem. She's dialed in, but everyone else is fucked yeah. up. So it is what it is. I, you know, I find it kind of um, funny that when I look at like guys in the military, when I look at guys in law enforcement, a lot of us have very, very similar upbringings. 
Very oh, yeah. similar. Yeah. You know, like challenging upbringings, whether it be abusive parents, whether it be non-existent parents, whether it be just all kinds of like, just a plethora of like family issues, you know? And it's like, why, why are we all drawn to like the military or law enforcement? Like, what is that? You know I, what I, mean? I think, uh, well, I think part of it maybe is just the chaos that you, uh, yeah. that you get used to and, you know, that it like trains you to, uh, you know, handle you know, the, you know, stressful situations as an adult. Yeah, probably. I mean, I know like yesterday when we were doing the ride along, I, uh, you got out of the car and one of the things I was, I, I like immediately like wanted to get out of the car too. And I was like, I don't even have a gun, idiot. Yeah. You know, I'm not a cop <laughs> <laughs> so, or a vest. I don't have a vest. I don't have shit. Yeah. Um, but there's still that sense of like duty of like, dude, like no, I can get down. You know, if yeah. someone tries to take you out, like I'll fight them. Yeah. <laughs> like, we'll get down, dude. Um, but no, it's just it's just one of those things. I think I think you're right, man. I think there is a, a sense of like we're used to to, to chaos, you know, yeah. like almost like there is comfort in chaos. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know for myself, like for most of my life until recently, like if things were too calm and cool and collected, like I would purposely <laughs> try and fuck them up. You know? I like, know there, I, I, there's so many friends that I grew up with, or even guys that I work with that. Right. If things are too good, yeah, they they look for chaos. Yeah, just totally sabotage the shit out of it. Yep. Because you're like, oh, this isn't normal. Like, what's yeah. going on? Like, something yeah. is. I need something's... chaos. They're like, I need chaos in my life. Yeah, I think that the other thing was uh, for me. Like, I always felt like with when things were too calm, it was almost like, oh, is this the calm before the storm? Like, what's coming? Yeah. So let me just create that storm, and then yeah. that way, like, I don't have to yeah. wait for like what's coming, you know, yeah. around the around the pike there. Um. So I want to go into like some of the uh, the challenges you talked about with your family, as far as like not being present and stuff like that. What about your like immediate family, like with your dad, your sister? your brothers or whatever, if you have any, like, did you notice any changes because of your profession with your relationship, like within your family? Uh, well, I mean, we didn't have a, a great relate. My, like me and my parents didn't have a great relationship anyway. Right. So um, it's hard to say that like, if my profession had any effect on it, I really, our relationship is what it is. And I don't right. think it matters what I, you know, what I do. But were they coming to you like for help, you know, like, oh, can you look into this for me? Can you get this ticket, you know, uh, you know, signed off for me? Can you do the asking you all kinds of questions and shit? Uh, not, not really. That's no. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Cause I know I did that well, a little I bit. I take that by my sister. I have an older sister. Uh, yeah, that was on the weekly. I that was. Yeah. <laughs> what can I do for you now? Sis? <laughs> yeah. What, yeah. What now? Right. Yeah. Now I would imagine because I know uh, a buddy of mine who's a cop, um, everyone goes to that guy for like questions, you know, about like about laws. Oh, is it okay? Like, you know, I carry a blade, you know, it's like, oh, is this blade legal, bro? And he's like, dude, to be honest with you, I don't even know what the fucking laws are anymore, yeah, dude. They yeah. change them so goddamn much. Yeah. I don't know. Stop yeah. asking me, dude. Yeah. Um, and so it was always, it always made me feel like, I don't know, hanging out with, uh, with my buddy, John and, and Pat, and even with you, it's like, I always feel like safer when I'm around people that are in law enforcement. You know what I mean? It's like, these guys are dialed in. It's funny. I had a, um, um, I went to a, like a psych, I don't know, psychiatrist, psychologist. I don't know. Um, he was like a hypnotherapist too or whatever. But one of the things he asked me, um, cause I was telling him like, I just don't feel safe all the time. You know, like I'm capable of taking care of myself, yeah. but there's so much chaos going on around me that like, I just don't, I'm safe when I have my gun on me. I'm safe because I know that I'm capable of taking care of myself but there's a bunch of shit bags in the world. So like, I just didn't feel safe just walking around. And uh, he's like, well, where do you feel the most safe? And I was like, on a military base with all my bros. And he's yeah. like, interesting. And that, it was the truth though. It's yeah. like, well, why is that? I was like, because I know for certain that like everyone has my back. Yeah. And it was the one time like, um, I, and I think this goes back to my childhood because like things were so chaotic. I could never let my guard down. I could, I always had to be on guard. I always had to be like my hands up, like always on guard because you never knew what was coming at you. And the first time in my life that I felt like I can let loose was when I was on a military base. Hmm. It's like, I can be a drunk, complete idiot and just be, just be a, like, let loose, like, let go. Like, you don't need to worry because you have all these people around you that will literally protect you and make sure that you're okay. It's one of the best feelings in the world, to be honest with you. And so that's why, like, for me, even to this day, being out of the military, my best friends are still guys I was stationed with. Yeah. My best friends are still law enforcement guys. Uh-huh. It's because they, they know what that's all about. They know yeah. that sense of community. Like when we walk into a restaurant, I mean, I don't know if I saw you doing it or you saw me doing it, but I'm scanning the restaurant to see oh, yeah. who's in there. I'm yeah. seeing like, where's the nearest exit? Like, I don't want my back to it. And like yesterday, like I saw where you sat and you were, uh, you were facing the door. I was like, shit, my back's to the door. I was like, no, nah, but he's armed. So it's just like, we're good. It'd be weird if he sat next to me. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's like, hey, dude, can I sit next? No yeah. homo, dude. I'm going to sit next. <laughs> we got this covered. Yeah. But it's kind of funny because even when we went to breakfast this morning, like Vanessa even like was like, oh, yeah, oh, I was I, like, I, you walked in ahead of me. I'm like, he's going to grab the seat facing the door. I was like. <laughs> We're sitting next yeah. to each other, bro. Yeah. Fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, dude. I should have taken I should have taken the seat next uh, to Vanessa, but uh, whatever. It worked out. <laughs> yeah, it, it is what it is. Um. What are some of the challenges that you see that are facing cops today? Like the biggest challenges as far as like the public is concerned and as far as like just society in general is concerned? Well, I mean, the, the biggest challenge we're facing is nobody wants to really be, you know, a cop or get into law enforcement anymore. When I say nobody, I mean, obviously not nobody, but just the talent pool is. Oh, do. it's, you know, it's probably, you know, 10 percent of what it used to be. Right. Uh, and we can talk about all kinds of reasons why, but uh, um, you can go into it if you want. Yeah, I mean, I think it you know started uh, you know really started back uh, with Ferguson, you know, right. uh, in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, with the the Brown shooting, yeah. uh, and you know the the media ran with a lot, you know, the whole lie of the hands up, don't shoot, and right. you know, kind of ever since then, uh, the media has just been beating us up, you know, for you know ten years now, right. so or how long, how long it's been, you know, nine years now. Right. So, you know, and then we had, you know, we had a president at the time that was uh, just right along, you know, right along with him. Right. And it's a fuck. It must be like a tough uh, line for you guys to walk. I mean, I know even for me, like I said, like, I know there's officers out there that, that the shootings are not justified. You know what I mean? Like it was an accident or it's just it was not a justified sh- uh, shooting and this and that. But what are the odds on that? Though? You know what I mean, like, yeah. the, I'd say the largest majority of them are justified shootings. You know what yeah. I mean? And if when you think about it, like put yourself in their shoes, you know what I mean? It's like you're thinking about your family and going home at night and this and that, and you got this guy here and you don't yeah, know what he's I mean, carrying. And I mean, use of force is ugly. There's, I mean, it is not pretty. Right. And, you know, when the general public who has no, you know, kind of formal training, they see it and it's, uh, it's ugly. So, right. you know, they don't, uh, they don't like the way it looks. Right. And, um, and you've been an officer involved shootings, right? Yeah. What was the thought process that went into it? You don't need to go in the specifics of that shooting or like who it was or where or why, but what were some of the specifics that like that went through your head like while you were in the moment, if you can remember? Oh yeah, it was uh, this dude's trying to kill me. Right. So die first. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> like I'm I'm going home to my wife and kids. Right. Yeah. Did you have those thoughts like while you were like in the moment, or was it all just muscle memory? Um, I, I'm sure I did, uh, but it was. It happened pretty fast. Right. And do you have any regrets as far as any shootings you've ever been? Like, do you lose sleep over any of them? I don't, I don't lose any sleep. I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're unfortunate, but uh, I, I don't lose any sleep over it. Do you think there's any guys that are on the department, yourself included? Like, do you think there's ever like any of these shootings or uh, calls that you responded to that are like later in life you're going to have to answer to? You know what I mean? Where it's like you're going to have to deal with it mentally, or do you think like, you're good at like compartmentalizing being like that's no, it's done it's part of my job and i'm out for me personally uh i i don't see myself having any issue you know later in life yeah. um like some people i work with uh m- maybe yeah uh there, there's somebody i work with that's been in i can think of at least three shootings off the top of my head in a two-year period so wow. um he he might he might have some things he's, he's going to deal with later in life right um, and the other thing we talked about yesterday that I wanted to mention that I thought is complete horseshit and hopefully maybe you have an answer as to what they can do about it and make it different do you think it's right that they can personally sue you <laughs> for some of this shit I know we talked about yesterday yeah. but like it's just bothering me you know it's like how yeah. is that reasonable yeah. it's like if I'm in a I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but it's like if I was in it, I worked for an ambulance company. It's like if I would have ran over somebody or hit somebody in the ambulance company, chances are it's covered by the, the company's insurance if I'm on the job. Yeah. I don't think I'm personally liable for that. You yeah. know what I mean? If I'm not drunk and I'm just doing my job, daily duties and I run somebody over, it's like, no, the company covers it. It's covered by the company's insurance. Why should a cop have to be personally liable for anything that happens on the job? It's bullshit. I agree. Is there any way to get around? <laughs> yeah, well, you, that's the system you, that, uh, you know, that we operate in, but yeah, I've been, uh, I've been sued at least twice where I've been sued personally. And you, but you haven't had to pay out. You've been good. Well, so one, far. one, one still pending. So right. keep your fingers crossed. I will do for sure. <laughs> um, have you seen a, a change, like a drastic change in the quality of police officers that are coming on versus when you came on? And if you have, what, what's the difference been? 
I wouldn't say I wouldn't say quality. I mean, uh, we're still hiring good people. Uh, right. It's just you know I'm a little bit old school, and I'm a you know I'm a Gen Xer, and now we're uh, we're hiring a lot of millennials, and uh, I see a difference. They're just different than I am, right. and so I think part of it is, uh, and I could be a little judgmental of uh, of uh, you know this new generation, but uh, I think it's one of those things that we need to. Like, you know, my generation maybe needs to adjust to how, you know, these millennials work. Yeah. I'm sure, you know, the baby boomers when, you know, when I was coming on thought, you know, negatively of my generation. So. Right. I mean, I think it is a generational thing. Like yeah. it's always like, oh, well, when I was a kid, you yeah. know, and like this, you know, and like, I think that's just going to continue till the end of time. But I've talked to other law enforcement people and people in special operations and, uh, even overseas, you know, because like I have this thing, we, I talked to you a little bit about this morning, like the, the pussification of America. You know, yeah. it's like when I was in high school, we did two days during, you know, hell week and we did, you know, it was brutal, you know, 100 and whatever degrees and you're out there sweating yeah. your balls off and whatever. But it taught us like discipline. It taught us hard work. It taught us dedication and um, and commitment. And nowadays it's like they don't they don't want to do that oh you can't push these kids too hard no yeah. no no you let you know oh dude, hey, there mandatory was, water break right what and then there was like a something where they had um my aunt was talking to me about it where they want to start uh school later now They're like we're gonna start school later because these kids need to sleep more <laughs> i'm like are you kidding me like is this really what's happening in the world like yeah. I, it, I don't think it's ever gonna get approved but it's like maybe it will though because that's kind of the direction we're going yeah. it's scary as fuck yeah. man and so like do you but you haven't seen a shift i mean you've seen a difference obviously because you're from a different generation but like is there more of softness do you think from some of the cops that are coming on now versus the ones that were on i think it's all it's all individual i mean i've seen yeah i mean i've seen some soft cops come through but i've i've seen some badass you know some badasses come through that are millennials you know so it's all individual i think yeah um i'm gonna ask you a couple questions um that I ask everyone that comes on. First one being that if you had a uh, one person or or one book or both, whatever, that inspired you the most, like through your whole entire career or life, like uh, what would that person be, or who would that person be, or what would that book be, and why? Well, uh, for a book, um, you know, Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink. He's a man. I, I'm sure most of your readers probably have read his book, but out of all the books that I've read, that that one had the biggest impact on me, both professionally and personally. I mean, it yeah. it helped me uh, in my day to day life at work, and then even helped me in my you know relationship with my wife. Yeah, I like it, man. No, yeah. I actually that that was my. Um new year's resolution i don't believe in new year's resolution so like i just wrote accountability like all over Uh my house like on all my mirrors like everywhere you look you see accountability posted up yeah it's just a reminder you know like just be accountable like don't make excuses for yourself you know if i if i'm being a fat lazy slob call it like it is i'm being a fat lazy slob you know i mean like i'm not gonna sit here and oh well because this well because no just because you didn't prioritize that's the end of the day man so yeah it is taking extreme uh ownership of your life what about a person? Do you have a person that inspires you the most? Yeah, well, I'll tell you a couple. So, uh, in a positive light, um, a high school football coach, uh, Pete Michaelettos, was just a great human being. Is he still alive? No, he passed away a couple of years ago. Yeah. But uh, as a testament to what a great person he was, there was, I'm going to say, three, four hundred people at his memorial. Yeah. So he touched a lot of lives. Just a just a good man. Uh, you know, he came into my life at a good time. You know, when I was you know, 15, 16 years old and uh, just had a positive impact on me. And he was very selfless. Yeah. Uh, I ran into him, you know, years, years later after high school. And he had been coaching for, you know, like 38 years at the time. And I said, man, where are you going to retire? And he's like, why would I retire? I love what I do. So, I mean, just just a good human being. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then, you know, I, I've talked about, you know, my dad and how abusive he was and just kind of an overall asshole. But, uh, you know, he did have a lot of uh, positive impacts on me. I mean, he was one of the hardest working dudes I've ever met in my life. Um, always hustling. He was working over, he would work overtime, you know, every weekend at work and if he wasn't doing that he he always had some side business going you know he was a phenomenal welder and fabricator and so he was always building stuff for for people on the side so he was just always working and you know just trying to you know trying to make things better so he definitely instilled a uh 
uh, a work ethic in me that stuck with me my whole life. So for that, um, you know, That's I'm indebted sure. to him. For sure. Uh, let's tell you, when uh, when I was about 11 years old, uh, he was a mechanic for United Airlines and he uh, they went on strike. And so he wasn't getting paid, he wasn't taking home a paycheck. And it was it went on for a long time. And so uh, he had to feed his family and pay his mortgage payment. So yeah. he went out and bought this uh, small little John Deere tractor and he started a landscaping business. Because uh, you know he had to make some money, and he ended up making more money doing that uh, than he was than he made at, uh, at as a mechanic at United Airlines. That's crazy. Man. So uh, I, I would end up on all, if I wasn't at school or on the weekends, I was basically working for him, and and uh, I mean he made it happen, you know, yeah. just uh, hustled to uh, you know make things happen while he's on strike. Something about the old school. Americans, you know, like just the grit. Yeah. You know what I mean, to somehow make it happen. You know, I had a, I, there's a story of, um, I never met him because uh, he died before I was born. My great grandfather, my grandmother's uh, dad, he um, would lose it. He was in construction, you know, so like it was seasonal, you know, like uh, construction would just, you know, things would happen, whatever. And so he would lose his job periodically because the yeah. contract was up or the project was done. And so he would go home, this blue collar, uh, blue collar worker, you know, go home, put on his best suit, and he would leave. Like he would leave the house, my grandma said, and he would not come home until he had another job. <laughs> so he would show up on these construction sites in a, in a full on suit and tie uh -huh. and, and apply for new jobs until he found another job. And uh, I was like, man, dude, that's like, you don't find that too much yeah. anymore. You know what I mean? And like, oh, yeah. um, I've always questioned, you know, for me, like I've always had a lot of drive. I've always had a lot of drive to like, just be the best that I can be, push myself to mm -hmm. whatever limits I can. And I was like, dude, where did I get that from? I definitely didn't get it from my mother. Like there's no <laughs> way. Um, I definitely did not get it from my father. I was like, dude, where does this come from? That might be it, man. It might yeah. be my great grandfather where that, that's just pure like yeah. grit, just grin and bear it and get through it. Yeah. Um, and so I'm thankful for that, man. Yeah. And I think we all have like, uh, you know, guides through our DNA, if you will, you yeah. know, that are, that are teaching us, you know, along the way or that we picked up things that we don't even probably yeah. aren't even aware of do that kind of help yeah. us, you know? Yeah. My dad's dad was, uh, he was the same way. He was, uh, he was a hustler, always yeah. had, always, he was building businesses and selling them left and right yeah. and just always hustling and, you know. Was he work. from here too? Like, uh, where'd your family like come from? They they come from Ireland or they came from like were they here like for? Oh uh, yeah, they've they've been here for a couple hundred years. But yeah. uh, my dad's side of the family is all from uh, like Washington State. Oh okay. And then he grew up in Santa Cruz. Okay, yeah. cool. Washington State is awesome. You, you up there ever or no? Uh, my cousin lives up there. Dude. Legit. Yeah. I tried to get my wife to go and she was like, no way. Yeah. Not Can't stand the weather. <laughs> dude, like I don't mind the weather. I, like for me, like I think it's kind of funny, dude. Like so. Um, I've always been like an, just an angry little fuck when I was younger, you know, just always like fired up and just, yeah. you know, whatever. So like the heat, I didn't like it. You know, I just couldn't stand the heat. Like oh. I didn't like it at all. And so I was asking somebody about it and it might've been one of those like new age, like airy fairy people or whatever, but they're like, well, it makes perfect sense. Like, cause you're just a fireball. Like you're just always like fired up about life or about yeah. something. And so the heat just kind of makes that worse for you. So like when you're in the cold, I always feel the cold soothes me. You know what I mean? Whenever I'm like, even when I feel like I'm bugging out a little bit, dude, I just put an ice pack on my neck or my chest or whatever, just calms yeah. me down gets me back to like normalcy or whatever. So I was like, man, Washington would be cool. But then I think about the rods and the screws in my back and I'm like, yeah, dude, yeah. I'll shovel snow for one winter. I'm like, nah, yeah. dude, that's it. I'm yeah, done. Warm weather is your friend. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm done. Yeah. So I was thinking that, you know, maybe, uh, maybe Scottsdale, you know, would be cool. Yeah. Um, just because longevity, you know, it's like I'm going to get older and my back's going to, you know, eventually deteriorate yeah. a little bit more. Um, either there or uh, fuck, I might join you, dude, in Georgetown, Texas. Texas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was uh, I was talking to Jeremy earlier that, you know, I do a pig roast or I go to a pig roast at my buddy's house in Sunset, Texas twice a year. And uh, I was like, hey, man, you got to come out dude, and hang out with a bunch of veterans. And, you know, we shoot a lot of uh, a lot of guns and. For those that drink, they you know drink a bunch of moonshine and uh, some of that shiner back, and it's uh, it's such a good time, man. Like I love like getting away from the city and just like hanging out and like doing like manly stuff, you know what I mean? And uh, it was funny because I had I had hunted before, you know, like not that much growing up. Um, you know, we would dress like uh, 
you know, rabbits and chickens and stuff like that. So I knew how to like prepare them, you know, field dress them and whatnot. But I'd never done a pig or a deer mm-hmm. or anything like that. And so uh, we get out there the first year and he's like, hey, you're going to kill this pig, okay? And I'm like, oh, all right. So I killed a bit, the pig and I mean, it, it was fine, whatever. But then you have to like dip it in hot water and then you have to like, you know, take all the fur off and do all these things and prep it and then you have to like gut it. And um, I think it's a really cool experience, man. Because yeah. I, I, I can say that maybe out of all the guys I grew up with, maybe one of them knows how to do that. Yeah. Maybe. And that's like, it, that's being generous. Chances yeah. are none of them know how yeah, to do that. As time shit. goes on, fewer and fewer, fewer yeah. people will know how to do that. Right. So like I like I told you the other day, man, I'm I'm just now so I'm learning how to do that stuff, you know, how to field dress an animal and husbandry and stuff like that. And then I'm also learning uh how to work on cars for the first time at thirty seven, yeah. you know, changing my rotors and brakes and yeah. oil and and I'm bringing my son along so he can pick up some of the you know, because yeah. I don't want to be just a lazy just a lazy dad, you know. It's like, nah, come on, man, let me teach you some shit. Yeah. You know, and then you can learn how to do this yourself. Because that's like for me. I don't have any like, uh, oh, poor me. I didn't have a dad, you know, like whatever. Like, yeah, part of that might've sucked. But at the end of the day, it's like, just do it differently then. Just yeah. do it differently with your yep. kids, you know? Yeah. So like for me, it's like, all right, cool. Let me do the best job I can and make sure my boys are like dialed in and, and they know everything they need to know to be productive members of society. Yeah, I definitely learned uh, a lot of lessons on how not to raise my kids. Right. And so I kind of do my best to not make the same mistakes that you know my parents made. Right. But I will say, uh, you know, my dad was, you know, he was a mechanic. Right. And uh, he was always building, you know, hot rods and race cars and buggies growing up. And so uh, I was forced because I was I was forced to help him, you know, in the garage. And so uh, I had no choice. I had to learn how to work on cars and mechanics and that kind of thing. So I was I was, looking back now as an adult. I'm super glad that, uh, you know, I was forced to learn all that stuff. Yeah. So, Cause I work on all of my own cars now. And I'm going to buy your car you have out there. <laughs> so, um, don't tell Vanessa. Dude, we'll just so do it gonna, like- I want to sell it. Cause I want to buy a, you know, 32 Ford Roadster when I go to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> you think Texas is going to happen? You think she'll let it go? I think it will. You think so? I hope so. Dude, Texas will be cool. Yeah. Um, and then maybe like if you guys are out there and there'd be like one more sell, you know, to my wife, like, come on, honey, yeah. let's just go out there. We got friends out there now. It's all good. Vanessa's going to be running her little studio doing, you know, hot Pilates. I'll definitely be going more than once a week. <laughs> um, yeah, that'd be awesome, man. Super cool. Um, what do you think some of the, for you, like being a police officer, what's the best part of that? for you uh you know i think the best part of it is uh you know i feel like i'm going out there and doing an important job and it's meaningful and you know having a a sense of service um because you know everybody you know when you i've sat on a lot of oral entry level oral boards and you know the main theme of what people say when they you know want to get hired is hey i want to help people and it kind of sounds corny but you know, when you get down to it, that's what you're out there doing every day. And there's a, you get a lot of satisfaction out of going and helping somebody that can't help themselves. Right. What's a perception that you would change with the general public if you could? Well, that's a tall order. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, one of the things that I probably, I feel that most people don't know is, uh, uh, is, Virtually every cop out there would lay his life down for a stranger, you know, to save their life. And I can say that for, you know, my department and every other police department that I've dealt with, you know, we all have kind of like the same core is, yeah, we're going to, we're going to go out there. If I got to lay my life down to tonight, I'm going to do it. Right. What do you think there's some, some things that we could do as a, as a country or like, what are some things that they could do to support? police officers and make more get just more awareness out there where it's like like you just said like it gives me the chills with you saying that because it's it's a fact i know it's a fact that these guys get such a bad rap because maybe there's a couple bad apples maybe there's not but i think the majority of that is just because what's being reported by the yeah. media and you miss all the other good shit that they're doing man yeah. all the all the, the kids that they're talking to and changing lives changing the course of their lives you know yeah. what i mean like stepping in and being mentors to people yeah. like my my union uh we just started uh a uh, scholarship program for high school seniors in Fremont that want to get into public service. Yeah. And so uh, each one, you know, we're going to give a thousand dollars to, you know, six uh, high school seniors, one from each uh, Fremont high school. Right. Uh, you know, we don't, it's not advertised, you know, yeah. nobody, nobody's, you know, knows about it, but there's a lot of, there's, you know, hundreds of things like that, that cops are doing every day. 
What do you think there's something that parents can do for their kids or teach their kids about police officers that can uh, like change the perception? perception well, I think it, they can hold their kids accountable, you know, starting when they're little. Right. And, uh, you know, I see a lot of attitudes nowadays, like, uh, you know, uh, kids can do, do no wrong. And that goes back to their parents and, you know, raising right. their kids right. Yeah. I remember uh, Jason Davis uh, on, on the podcast we did together he was saying that like uh, one of the parents was like, uh, hey, you better stop doing that. I'm going to go get this police officer and he's going to arrest yeah, you. I hate that. And uh, he hates it. He's like, dude, yeah. it sucks. Like now you just changed the perception of that kid for yeah. the rest of his life. He's going like, to yeah. think I'm a bad person. And mm-hmm. he's like, I'm not here to be bad. I'm here to save your life. I'm here yeah. to like take care of you and keep the peace. Too. Yeah. I'm not here to like or, parent or, your kid. Or when we get the call, a uh, parent calls us about their 15-year-old kid or their teenager that yeah. I can't control my kid. Well, you should have started that, you know, 14 years ago, you know, <laughs> right. how am I going to come in here and fix your problem for you? Right. Yeah. It's, it's a bummer, man. Um, the other question I want to ask you, if you had one lesson uh, that you learned in your life that you wish that somebody would have taught you um, so you didn't have to experience the same heartache that you did uh, growing up, whether it be, you know, having kids, whether it be, um, you know, just through life or career. Um, and you wish that you could like share that message with somebody else so they don't have to experience some of the same heartache. What would, that, what would that lesson be and why? Well, I think I would, t- especially some of these, uh, you know, new cops that are starting out today is, um, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm two, three years away from retiring. And when I walk out that door that, you know, that machine is going to keep on rolling and I'm going to be irrelevant. Yeah. And so, you know, don't get this inflated ego that you are so important and such an integral cog in the wheel that uh, can't go on without me. You will be replaced tomorrow, bro. Right. So it took me a long time to figure that out, but uh, I mean, I'm totally a piece of that now. I know, I know how I know how it works. You know, we, you know, last year we had uh, we had a ch- police chief retire, and it was like the next day that machine kept on rolling. It was nothing yeah. changed. What are some of the things that uh, that you think police officers can do to take care of themselves a little bit better as far as their bodies are concerned? Because, like, I mean, uh, just so you guys know, like, Jeremy's, like, had – he's broken his neck, um, which was an off-duty accident. However, it still happened. Um, and he had to go back to work after that broken neck because he has a family to provide for. He has a bad hip that's uh, been operated on, right, already? Twice. And uh, needs a full, like, hip, hip replacement. And we just went to a, a hot Pilates class and he crushed the workout. So like he's doing his part to like get his body to where it's mobile and agile and, you know, where he can move around properly. And um, what do you think there, is there anything you think some cops can do though to like help themselves so it's oh, not, so they're not taking a beating? For sure. I mean, that's kind of like the hot topic in law enforcement right now is, you know, employee wellness. Right. Uh, so, I mean, obviously, you know, taking care of your body because you're only given one body in this lifetime. So, yeah. uh, man, work out, get off the couch, don't be lazy, you know, try to try to control what you put into your body, you know, yeah. try to limit the alcohol yeah. um, and just work out, you know. Yeah, that's a trip. There was, uh, I forget who was talking. Oh, um, Jeff Nichols, the guy that I was telling you about to uh, uh-huh. to check out on Instagram. He was saying that people will talk to him about human optimization, but in the same sentence, they're talking about how much alcohol they're drinking on the weekend. Well, can you know, can, you know I'm trying to do this human optimization, but uh, you know, I'm going to have a couple <laughs> beers on the weekend. He's like, if you're literally have optimization and alcohol in the same sentence, you lost me. Yeah. And he's, he's one of those guys where it's accountability. Yeah. It's, it's extreme, extreme ownership where it's yeah. like, if you're saying that you want to be totally, totally like uh, optimal, then alcohol's got to go. Yeah. You know? And I see it a lot. Um, and it's, again, just because I don't drink, I'm not, I used to drink and I'm not judging those that do at all, not yeah. the slightest. All I'm saying is that I see a lot of guys, uh, firefighters and uh, police officers, that that's their coping mechanism. Like they get off work and it's like they want to decompress. So what do they do? They go straight to booze and it's got to have a lasting effect on some of these people, man. Like it's got, it's going to, it's going to catch up eventually. Um, And you don't see, it's kind of funny. You don't see a lot of like fit cops nowadays. Like I'd say the majority of cops that you see on the beat, like if I'm, if I were to look around a bunch of cops, most of them are not like fit dudes. You know, like you don't see Ronnie Coleman's like walking yeah. around like all oh, jacked. Wasn't he? he was a cop. He was a cop in yeah. Dallas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, I mean, that's the rarity. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know what that is. If it's like a lack of time or a lack of like just prioritization of like prioritizing yeah. their time well, properly I mean, or whatever. I, I can make a million excuses. I mean, but there is some physiological, you know, 
uh, effects on your body that law enforcement takes. I mean, we work 12 hour shifts. Right. Uh, we, we're not getting enough, none of us are getting enough sleep. Yeah. You know, you're, you're, you're running call to call, so your, your diet sucks. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, all those things add up, you know, I'm not trying to make excuses, but uh, you know, those things take a toll on, on your body and your, your physio- physiologically. I wonder if they would, uh, if they would support like for, you know, officer wellness, like a meal, like meal prep service for officers on the department, you know what I mean? And be mm-hmm. like, we want our officers to be as well-trained and as well, you know, uh, yeah. nourished as possible. So we're going to pay for your meals to be delivered to your house. You just got to do it. That'd be awesome. I think it'd be totally, I think it's a cool idea yeah. because it's, I mean, it's not, it's not cheap, mm-hmm. but if you look at like, if you were to do a cost benefit analysis and say, okay, this is how much it's going to cost for us to mail all these meals to each of our officers. Okay. How much are you going to save on insurance bills? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like how many guys are going to be going to the hospital yeah. for high blood pressure for this, for that, for the other thing? And how many, how much of that can you uh, curtail by by having a healthy diet, yeah. you know? And then get, do you guys get like free gym memberships or anything? No. So we, uh, we used to, but uh, now I showed you our gym. We have See, a pretty, decent gym, yeah, gym we have pretty <laughs> decent gym and then we yeah. have our outdoor CrossFit gym. So right. uh, we have enough stuff there. You're going to get a good workout. So for sure. they don't, they don't pay for a gym membership anymore. But uh, the one thing we have that not everybody gets is we get an hour a day to work out on duty. Right. That's that's really cool, actually. Yeah. Super cool. Hopefully, guys are taking that opportunity to actually do it, though. A lot, a lot of guys do, but still, I'm, I'm dumbfounded by the ones that don't. Because you're getting paid, right? Yeah, you're on the – yeah, you're on, it's on paid, your shift. You're getting yeah. paid to work out. Yeah. It's a trip, man. Now, I think I think they're, they're heading in the right direction with a lot of these things. Uh, again, I'm not in law enforcement, but I just know a lot of people that are, and like – you know, if there's anything that I can do to, to like kind of, hey man, why don't you try this or whatever? I mean, I don't know if I'm gonna listen to my dumbass, but like, I don't know the meal replacement thing. I think would be kind of cool. You know, what I mean, I, like I'd just, be down for it. I'll talk to your chief. I'll send. Yeah. Her. Is it a male or a female? We have a female chief. I'll send her a letter. Yeah. <laughs> see if she, hey see man, she's, she's on board. She's she's all about employee wellness. So no, I mean, I think yeah. I think it's a it's a real thing, man. Because if you think about it, it's so easy. And I watch my brother do it all the time. Um, he's like now I think he's a. Uh, he might be a vegetarian now. He he was worried about his heart and some of that, so he went vegetarian. And which I'll I did it for three weeks and it was the worst three weeks of yeah. my life. So I'll never do it again. Um, too but, much of a carnivore. Yeah, to me, you and me both. But he uh, he's doing it and he feels great. So I'm like, yeah, more power to you, yeah. man. Do it up. But there were there were some times where he was like putting on weight and getting chubby and this and that. And well, what is that? Well, let's see. His adrenals are probably taxed because he's not sleeping. He's in high stress environments. Mm-hmm. And he's on a rotational shift where his body can never get in the right like yep. circadian rhythm. Yeah. There's a lot of things that are like going against police officers that don't help in the process. Yep. And uh, and then so it's like, well, what do you what do you want? Well, of course, what, what's an officer going to crave when his body's all out of wacky, like um, you know, at a chemical level? Um, you know, donuts, of course. You know, like donuts, uh, like uh, these like complex carbohydrate or like uh, simple carbohydrates. You know, sugar, like things like that. Energy drinks to yeah. keep you going. And, uh, and you can see it was taking a toll on his body, you know, like yeah. big time. And I see it a lot with a lot of officers, yeah. you know, so if they can do something to change that, that'd be awesome. You know, I went like 10 years without eating donuts because I was so bothered by the uh, stereotype. <laughs> I'd be like, I'm not, I'm touching, not eating a donut, I'm not bro. touching that donut. <laughs> I got so over that, that though. Yeah, yeah. You got older, you stopped giving a fuck. <laughs> Lots of fucks to give, dude. So I don't care what you guys think. I'm going to eat this donut in uniform yeah. every day. Fuck you guys. Nah, man. Hey, I appreciate you, uh, you know, allowing me to come up here and, and do that ride along in the only Tesla Tesla patrol car in the entire world. So old JB got to go and uh, do a ride along on that, which was really cool. Um, I would never want to drive one. Um, I think it's a cool. I think it's a great idea, but I would never want to be in one as a police officer just because, like, if you're a bigger dude, like getting in and out of that thing is kind it's of it's a struggle for me. But uh, know, it's challenging. Uh, we're t- we're just testing the technology. Yeah, so yeah. if the technology works for law enforcement, we'll probably go with the, you the, know, SUV. the SUV model, the Model X. Yeah, yeah. So the SUV model I think would be awesome, especially for bigger guys like you, yeah. because like when you're holding all your gear and then just trying to get in and out, it's like your hips already bad, bro. <laughs> so make it worse, yeah. dude. Um, but no, I I really appreciate you taking the opportunity, man, to come on the podcast, allowing me to come up here and. Um, and uh, do that right along with you, and then also invited me to, to you know stay at your house and do that hot Pilates class, man. Um, yeah, glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, I, well, I'm not gonna say I en- well I enjoyed the ride along. <laughs> I did not enjoy that class. Um, I feel good now. I'm glad yeah. I did it. 
but uh, definitely highlights some of the things I need to work on yeah. for sure. Because you think like, you're, oh, I'm, I'm, all, I'm well on my way, man. I'm working out. It's good to go. I'm getting back in it. Yeah, it's totally good different. to that. Dude, yeah. it's like a kick in the balls, man. Yeah. I was like, dude, this is gnarly, man. I can't even like breathe. Yeah. <laughs> like, so I told you, I like when the peacocks come in, they think, ah, oh, this is a yoga studio. This is going to be nothing. <laughs> and they're face first by halfway through. Oh, for sure. No, yeah. I was getting all lightheaded and shit. I was like, oh, man, this is gnarly. But, you know, getting all that sweat out, man, was pretty cool. Just fat crying. But yeah, man, I look forward to linking up with you again. And if we can um, set something up, man, where um, you can come on one of these Texas trips with me, man. Maybe oh, dude, to- totally down for Texas trip. Shoot some guns, hang yeah. out, do a bunch of America stuff. Yeah. All right, brother. Well, thanks again, man. Yeah. You want to talk, talk, talk about my broken neck? Oh, shit. Yeah, <laughs> dude. Before we sign off. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to let Jeremy share this story real quick because I think it's fascinating. Um, and mainly, I mean, one of the main reasons why it's fascinating to me is because obviously I've had the six back surgeries and I'm coming back and making my way back in a full recovery. And uh, he has a, a very similar story and um, and it's fascinating. So I want him to share it with you. So go ahead, man. Take it away, dude. Share that. Uh, so, uh, so several years ago, I was uh, uh, some friends that I work with talked me into racing motocross, and so I started racing and have a little bit of success. And so I wanted to get better, and so uh, I wanted to uh, start cross training with uh, mountain biking. Yeah. So uh, I got online and figured uh, I found the best mountain bike I could find, and so I ordered it. And uh, I was uh, I was. May seventh, two thousand fourteen. I was uh, at a train. I was at some training, and I got my notification that my bike arrived. So I was all excited. Oh, so I candy jammed, shop. <laughs> jammed home, and uh, put the bike together. And so uh, I told my wife, I said, "I'm gonna go for a quick ride. I'll be back in like fifteen minutes. I just want to go shake the bugs out." So then, uh, so I went for about a four mile ride, and I was on my way back about a half mile from uh, from the house and I was crossing a major intersection against a green and I was in the crosswalk. And as I uh, got about halfway through, I see this Subaru Forester uh, in, my, uh, in my peripheral vision. So I look over and I could see, I looked down through the windshield as it was approaching me and I could see the dude was on his phone. I don't know if he was texting or whatever, but he was staring at his phone screen. Right. He was doing about 35 miles an hour. So I knew that I was going to get hit. So uh, I did my best to try to uh, minimize the hit. And so I took a turn to the left, like to turn away from him. Right. And so he hit me uh, kind of square on the back wheel. And that sent me into a somersault. So uh, arms and legs were wide out like I was doing a somersault. And uh, it, it, it was really weird because I went into slow motion and I had this inner dialogue with myself. And so I was talking about, all right, we can survive this, you know, uh, just minimize your landing. You'll be okay. Right. And then as I'm talking to myself, I realized I did about two or three rotations in this somersault. And then I realized, yeah, I'm not going to be able to control my landing. And there's so, no way to like twist your body anywhere. There is no way at that force that you can, there's nothing you could do. Oh, wow. Uh, so I was telling myself there was, but there really wasn't. It's so funny you're having that dialogue while yeah. you're flying. Oh, dude, it, it seemed like I had a good minute you know, in the air to have this inner dialogue. <laughs> and it lasted probably a fraction of a second. Right. And so I ended up coming down flat on my head, straight down on my head. It was a pretty hard impact. And then I, sat up and I was uh, in the middle of the intersection now and I had the most uh, excruciating pain to my uh, from my left elbow up to my shoulder and I thought oh man I just and I don't know why I knew I'd landed on my head but uh, I go man I just destroyed my shoulder and so yeah I'm thinking man I'm not going to be able to race for a long time you know and so uh in a matter of seconds, that pain shot from my elbow up to my neck, and it was pretty excruciating to the point where, I mean, I've broken a lot of bones in my life. I knew immediately that I broke my neck. So then now I'm I'm, I'm angry, I'm pissed off at this driver, oh, yeah. and he's out of his car, and so, uh, you know, I now I'm motherfucking him, and- I love that story. And You're I'm like scooting, scooting, I'm scooting <laughs> on my ass, like, to go after him. <laughs> And then I quickly Broken realized, neck, like, this is, yeah, this is stupid. And he was like, dude, I'm sorry, but he's backing up, right? So, uh, you ever seen the show Vikings? I don't mean to interrupt, but you ever no, seen Vikings? Uh, oh, so, like, one of the, the, 
Vikings on the show. Like he has no legs. Like they call him uh, a boneless or whatever. He had no bones in his legs. So like uh-huh. he would crawl on his arms, dude, and like just jack people up. So when you were telling me that story, I was I was having a visual of this Viking. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, go ahead. So uh, so anyway, the paramedics get there, and uh, I tell them right away. I go. I broke my neck. I landed straight on my head. I know I broke my neck. Yeah. They're like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they didn't believe me. They're like, yeah, right. And so they loaded me up in the ambulance and I uh, took an ambulance ride to uh, the Kaiser actually in Fremont. And uh, they they rolled me in there and the doctor uh, tell her what happened. And she starts yelling immediately at the paramedics because they didn't have me in a C-spine. Right. So they, they, they rolled me into uh, the scan room and they did a they did a cat scan and I didn't think they did it. actually I think they just because I landed on my head they went straight to a cat scan and then found out uh, that I I broke uh, C four and then uh, in my neck and then C three was uh, dislocated and it uh, rotated ninety degrees and so it was it was pressing against my uh, spinal cord yeah. so I went in for surgery the next morning and uh, they put in a plate. Titanium plate, four screws, a cadaver bone, and a rod in my neck, and fused uh, C3 and C4 together. So I spent about five days in the hospital. Um, they had me so drugged up that I, the first couple of days, I don't even remember. Yeah. Like people would come in and visit me, and I don't it's even a, remember. It's like a dream world. Don't even remember talking to them. Uh, yeah. I remember going back to work and. People were talking to me about when they came to visit me. I'm like, hey, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't even remember that you came to see me. Right. So I remember it was like day three in the hospital and my neck was hurting so bad that my, uh, Vanessa was telling uh, the nurse like, hey, his neck's killing him. You got to do something. And so all they were just doing is pumping more uh, painkillers in. Yes. And she had to say, you know, I was kind of, I was so out of it. She said, hey, how about you stop giving him painkillers and like undo his dressing and put ice on his neck. Right. How about you do that? And they're like, oh, okay. And so uh, that was the that was the magic cure for the pain. It was not painkillers. Yeah. It was uh, it was so inflamed, and so they iced it yeah. for you know the whole night. And I was like instantly better. She'd so. probably be one of the best patient advocates ever. She's such a <laughs> she's such a pickle, dude. Yeah. So she's like, dude, get your shit together. I can just hear her. Yeah. It's fucking hilarious. Yeah. Um, so then you uh when did you go back to work? So I spent about six weeks on the on the couch and uh talked my doctor into letting me go back to work light duty after six weeks. Yeah. It was the the day that they let me take the brace off that I talked him in to uh let me go back to work. It's crazy, man. Yeah. So I went back to work light duty. So, I mean, it's not like I was uh, out on the street or anything, but uh, 12 weeks to the day of my accident, I talked the doctor into put me back full duty. So I was back working full duty after 12 weeks. I'm breaking your fucking neck. Yeah. It's insane. Did you think that any of that was like, they weren't pushing you, right? You were the one pushing it? Oh, they, I was pushing hard. Yeah. So they would have let, let you stay out even longer? Oh yeah. Which you probably should have. Probably looking back, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's a trip, and this uh, the reason that I like that story is number one, like you didn't quit, you didn't stop. You're oh, there still was working. never, there was never a, ever a single thought of quit in my head, right? And the fact that like we go to this hot Pilates class, and, and like we, uh, I, w- I did the ride on last night, and I had to go pick up my stuff and then come back here, and so I got here a little bit before you did. You didn't get home till what, like twelve thirty? Yeah. And you probably didn't go to bed till I don't know what time. I would, probably fell asleep at one thirty. Yeah, and then we're up for this class at six. At five thirty. Oh, we're up at five thirty. Yeah, for the class uh, and that starts at six, and it's like uh, it's a trip, man. Because most people will be like, "No, I'm tapped. I'm done." You know what I mean? Like I've had I've had neck surgery, I've had hip surgery, like whatever. I just want to chill when I'm off work. But it's like, no, those are the people that have longevity because they just yeah. keep going, dude, and keep like doing these things. Like in that class, I was impressed, man. I was like, wow. No, oh, thanks. I mean, you're older than me and you've had just as many surgeries as I had, you know, like if not more extensive, you know, and it's like, and I was struggling hard. <laughs> you know, like, struggling hard, man. But no, that, that was good shit. I appreciate you sharing that story. And it's a great, great story of mindset. You know what I mean? Some of it is like, we need to know like when to be smart and just take a step back. Yeah. But there's also uh, the other part of that where it's like, you gotta like, you don't know what your limits are until you test them, yeah. you know? So. Well, after I went back to work, um, I kinda, I think I, I was telling you about it. I would, uh, I get a little bit of anxiety yeah. when people would walk up behind me and, 
uh, or talk to me where I couldn't turn my head to talk to him because my, I lost so much mobility. I probably lost, you know, 50% of the mobility in my neck. Right. And then I kind of felt, I felt like weak in my neck. And so, uh, uh, I, I mentioned that, I think I told you that, uh, this morning that, uh, uh, I wanted to go back and race one more time. Yeah. And so I talked to my doctor Crazy and he's ass. like, I don't recommend it. I'm like, but you know, but will I die? You know? So, <laughs> so uh, did you die? Yeah. So I talked to, talked my wife into letting me go back and race one more time. So yeah. like two years after my accident, I went back and I did one more motocross race just to. So just you done to, now? Is that your system? I, I have not. I, I, I I probably won't race motocross again. Probably. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> not gonna not gonna rule that out. Yeah. But most likely, probably, yeah. probably not gonna do it. Yeah. Nah, but that that's super legit, man. And I love surrounding myself with people like you that just don't like quit. Where it's like you don't feel sorry for yourself. I don't see you popping a bunch of pain pills. It's like nah, I'm just no. gonna go to work, keep trucking. I'll go do some hot Pilates, and you're taking care of yourself, man. Yeah. Like we went to uh, we went to the counter yesterday to get a uh, a burger. And here I am. I mean, I'm like, well, I'm at the counter, man. I might as well get a burger, you know? So I get a burger with the old brioche bun. And I look over at Jeremy. He's got like a lettuce bowl, you know, <laughs> like, like, no carb action, making me look like an asshole. But hey, he's he's doing it the right way. And I was like, well, I'm traveling, bro. So there's my yeah, excuse, yeah, you know? <laughs> I enjoy a brioche bun every once in a while. Yeah, dude, who doesn't? Yeah. But hey, man, thank you again for uh, for coming on the show, man, and for having me up here. And I, I genuinely look forward to linking up again with yeah, you. Yeah, I want to do that Texas trip. Yeah, we'll do that Texas trip. And if you're ever down in Southern California, man, uh, hit me up. We'll for get sure. together. And uh, they're not all liberals down there, man. Some of them like, <laughs> some of them like their guns. So uh, now we'll go to the range down there if you want, man. We'll shoot Yeah. And uh, and have a good time, man. Sounds good. All right, brother. We'll talk soon. All right, thanks. Later. Thank you for listening to My Backstory. Stay motivated and stay connected off the show. Follow at my underscore backstory underscore to be a part of the journey to recovery and to see where your story goes. Or visit us online at hereismybackstory.com.